meeting is being recorded. Um, I'll start it as well. Okay, well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to this afternoon's meeting. As I'm sure we all know, Eleanor Marx was the daughter of Karl Marx and had a, uh, an entirely political legacy of her own. Um, possibly not as well known as she should be, but this afternoon, Leslie Mahmood and uh, Felicity Dowling are going to give us a bit of a rundown on her life. So I don't know how we want to arrange this. Do you want to go one at a time? Or? Um, what we're going to do, Pam, is... Um... Felicity's going to run the presentation and me and Felicity are going to sort of share that between us. So we'll be uh, mixing them and, uh, and, and matching, but we know what order we're doing things in. That's great. OK, thank you. Just before we start, can I just ask everybody to keep on mute unless they're actually speaking so we don't get any, obviously, apart from the speakers, so we don't get any background noise. So just, so just one or two more people coming in. Right. Do you want to kick off? Um, Felicity's going to screen share. Okay. Thanks. Can can everybody hear me properly? Yes. Thanks. This is by way of a celebration of Eleanor Marx. It's not a complex, detailed approach. There are it's a fair amount of detail, but it's not intended to be like an academic approach. It's a discussion about what we can learn from Eleanor Marx and, and truly how we should celebrate the, um, the legacy that she leaves us. Um, Eleanor was a linguist and a translator. She was the first person to translate Ibsen into English, the first person to translate Madame Bovary. And at that time, Madame Bovary was a very, very shocking novel to, you know, she was very daring for her to translate it. She mm. translated the first English edition of Capital, her father's work, and together with Engels, she collated most of Marx's papers after his death. Um, she was a woman worker. She had to earn her own living. Um, they grew up in quite serious poverty, and the death of several of the um, Marx children uh, was testament to the level of poverty they were living in. Her first job at 19 was as a teacher, but she later worked mainly as a translator. Um, she was a campaigner for women's trade unions and a founder member of the General and Municipal Workers Union. She is still recognized by that union as one of their founders. She was a street speaker for socialism um, and she spoke at meetings all across, the, across Britain and into the United States. She was a revolutionary, an internationalist, and the founding organizer of the Second International. She played a key role in English socialism, collaborating with Engels, William Morris, and many more, playing a part in the work that led up to the founding of the Labour Party. She was a fighter in many ways for women's rights. And she was one of four daughters of Karl Marx and Jenny von Westphalen, and self-proclaimed as a Jewess and as a Fenian. Um, and again, it, was, it wasn't like the current day to be talking about whether you're Jewish or not Jewish. Jewish workers at this point were the lowest of the low in the, uh, in the working class in Britain. Sorry. So, Leslie. Okay, yeah. So, obviously, this is not an academic discussion. So, why do we want to discuss Eleanor Marx and um, what's the relevance to 2023 and the issues that we face? Well, she was one of the founders of socialism and of the trade unions in England, Wales and Ireland. And as Felicity said, she was a street speaker for socialism. She was actually noted for going into East End pubs and standing on the table and speaking to, you know, when the various strikes were going on in the East End, for instance, um, and speaking to uh, mass meetings of trade unions. She was also fluent in um, in many languages and used those skills for the movement. She translated not just the key books and documents, but at early meetings of the, um, the Second International. She was also recognised as um, a brilliant organiser. She was closely involved with Lissa Garay after the Paris Commune and collaborated in the production of his book. And she actually translated the first English version in um, 1870, uh, 
seven. Um, and as Felicity mentioned, she was a working woman. Ba- basically, at the time, her, uh, her family was penniless and dependent on support from Engels. And at 16, she actually left home to make her own way as um, a teacher, uh, returned home when she got ill. Um, and she also worked then closely with her father on Capital and other books. She was totally committed to women's freedom and women's rights. We think she may have had some understanding of uh, contraception. And she absolutely understood the need to organise with working class women. There was also many different socialist groups around and she worked with them. Uh, Sometimes she found that extremely frustrating, but she makes very clear the importance of the work of agitating for socialism the fundamental importance of trade unionism and political representation of the working class, because remember, this is the days pre uh, the founding of the Independent Labour Party um, and the Labour Party itself. Um, And she organised and collaborated, despite differences with all the great socialists of um, her era and translated work for a lot of them, for instance, Plekhanov. She was a revolutionary through and through and an internationalist and she was also interested and in developed literature and uh, drama, as uh, Felicity said. So over to you, Phil. Okay. Okay. Right. Next time you see a tin of cross and blackwell soup, remember Eleanor Marx was the person who got the women or women making the soup organised first. She was crucial to that strike, and that's recognized on the GMB's um, website to this day. Um, Women were very, very much um, second class citizens in many ways and yet were crucial to a lot of factory work. Um, So she was around when the Bryant, when the the match match women for uh, organized one of the first of the new union, the new unionism um, struggles and it was the beginning of what became known as new unionism where workers long considered unorganized will organize themselves and acted collectively to fight for better working conditions and pay. She was a great supporter of women workers as she was of um, all unskilled women workers. Across from Blackwell factory she helped organize 400 women onion skinners. Uh, I love that in their strike against harmful work and little pay. Um, she was involved in the, all the main struggles that took place in the East End of London, particularly those around the gas and the dock workers. It was the year that Eleanor along with Will Fawn formed the National Union of Gas Workers and General Labourers. Later, it would merge into other unions and go on to become the, what we know as the GMB now. Over 800 gas workers joined on the first day of the gas workers union's launch. And in just two weeks, over 3,000 had signed up. Um, Eleanor formed the first un- women's branch and the union conference, and she was unanimously elected onto the executive, a post she held till June, 19, uh, June 1895. So Eleanor was key to the development of new unionism when uh, trade unions were founded by unskilled workers. She was ex- elected to the executive of the GMB and Eleanor was deeply involved in the campaigns for the eight hour day. She worked closely with Will Thorne, the eloquent but illiterate gas workers leader and taught him to read and write. He remained a close friend until her death. I was thinking in putting in the pictures of Will Thorne, which picture to put in, there's an older picture showing him as an MP in 1946, which means that Roger's dad probably knew him. It's a really, you know, close connection. Um, But Will Thorne was essential to the found, the idea of people, ordinary people forming unions and demanding a political voice. So I think... The next one is Leslie. Yeah, there was, um, as I said before, Eleanor worked with many uh, different socialist groups of the 1880s and uh, 1890s. And uh, some of her report, as quoted, will sound quite um, familiar to us today. 
Uh, the social pro. This is her words. The social program is now consciously or unconsciously the program of the new unionism. Yet, as we've already said, there's no socialist party in England. There are a great many socialist parties all doing good work in their way, but they are sects rather than a party. They each have, if not a little hell, at least a little coterie of their own. Of these socialist parties, the largest and the one that has done more, perhaps, than any of the other socialist organisations, with the help of many now no longer counted among its members, to spread the teachings of scientific socialism among the workers is the Social Democratic uh, Federation. Then there's the Fabian Society, which proved a boon to those middle class folk too honest to be contented with the present conditions of society, too educated to throw in their lot with the Salvation Army, too superior to identify themselves wholly with the profane vulgar, i.e. the working class. The Fabians, besides giving an immense number of lectures and publishing some useful statistics, have in the provinces done more, they're less superior, have been of no small service in bringing together socialists anxious to help in the work of organisation, but not able to see their way clearly to working with the SDF. There's also the Bloomsbury Socialist Society, besides doing much good educational work, may claim the honour of having initiated the May Day eight hours demonstration in the, um, in, in the UK. So that's probably reminiscent of some of the stuff, the people that we've got around today with scattered socialist parties that aren't really parties. Um, because obviously with the demise of the of the, the Labour Party under um, under Starmer. So, but Eleanor had an approach of working with people where she could on specific issues like the eight hour day. Um, she also went round and spoke to m many of the uh, radical clubs, which again weren't socialist, but you know were kind of on the left of, of society. She spoke at the Jewish Federation of uh, Federation Trade Union branches, and she did many many speaking tours around uh, Lancashire, where, for instance, the um, you know many of the textile women workers were actually organised. She went up to Scotland and. Um, you know, and and abroad. So if you put the next slide up for me, Fliss. Thank you. But as part of this, um, Eleanor recognised that women workers were absolutely key and couldn't be left behind in these industrial struggles. And again, here's some quotes from her. Even the working man, for the most part, still looks upon the woman, woman of the household as domestic animals, more or less in his personal property. What the woman earned is usually being considered in the light of a useful additional sum to the general income of the home, not as the wage paid an independent worker for actual work done. And the woman herself reduced to the very lowest verge of misery, of despair and of dependence, earning a wage that even in the more skilled kinds of labour generally means starvation, having, in addition to the long hours of labour for the employer, to do the work of the domestic sort for an immediate taskmaster, or where she's a widow or a married mother with children dependent on her, or even when she's alone in the world, having to toil on long after men for the most part have ceased work. What time could she have, even had she the desire for attending meetings or for organising? And that's still, you know, a, a problem for today with many women working, um, you know, long hours, the skills being driven down, pay being driven down, help army of um, casual uh, workers has been a recent um, survey by the um, the Living Wage Foundation, which shows that you know women are, are have the greater proportion today of casual work um, than uh, than do than do men. So. Although they've made gains, these gains are being pushed back in the uh, pushing women into the unskilled and half a million women workers are paid below the living wage um, compared to, um, I that's about 13% compared to 9% of, um, of men. Um, and she also talks about the recent years, the inexorable logic of facts is doing for the women workers what it has been doing for the unskilled men workers. 
forcing them to recognise their tr true position. Above all, men are beginning to see that where the women, woman doesn't work with the man, the employer uses her against him, and that therefore, from even the simplest motives of self-preservation, the man must try and help the woman to fight with him against their common enemy and exploiter. Now, obviously, some of that is quite, you know, stressing the importance to, to you know, to the, um, you know, to, to the, the man. But, you know, obviously, Eleanor worked directly with many, many uh, women. And um, as Felicity said, she formed the gas workers, the women gas workers branch and was elected as delegate to the uh, conference. Um, and in the picture, it shows a, a woman mine worker. And um, it just reminds you of uh, some people may know, uh, may remember Muriel Browning, who's been dead for some years, but she was came from um a, a welsh mining um you know community and was a very active trade unionist i think she was an engineering worker for for quite some time um you know but it's kind of a, again retying that um that knot of history because although women don't work in the mines they're still in the most um awful jobs in them um, you know in in many cases and you know the vast majority of uh cleaners, uh, the low paid workers, the so-called unskilled, un uh, um, something like 80% of care workers, and about 80% of um, NHS workers overall. So it's still the same battle of divide and uh, rule, which obviously Eleanor fought against. So Felicity, over to you. Okay. Um... Some of you will have read Striking a Light by um, she, um, by Louise Raw. Definitely worth a read if you if you haven't read it. It's the story of the match women and their strike, and it's very very clear in the link between this first sort of strike. Those women were the family of the men who formed the dock union. You know, some years later, this was the start of new unionism and although the conventional histories will tell you that it was the liberals that helped um, those women they came to the street stall socialists and asked for help um, and we should always remember that if you're out on a stall you know if you're there at least if there's a mood someone will come to you um, and these are all quotes the quotes are from the are from the GMB um, so I don't want to spend too much much longer on this. This is Eleanor Marx deep in the working class struggle. Um, and then the, because she could speak many languages without a formal education, she grew up in a multilingual household. So French, German and French and English would all be spoken there. And she learned Norwegian. She learned she learned many languages so that she could translate. Um, but she gave a report, and I've got late, one of the later slides. There's a link to that report if anyone wants to follow it through. She gave a report to the second international meeting in Brussels, and she reported on what was happening with new unionism to in in Britain. And it's a really interesting report and very appropriate to where we are today um, with the, the unions beginning to come back into action and the need for political representation of the class. Um, so I just want to read some of what we've got on the screen that a word upon the immense advance of the international side of the working class movement in the United Kingdom. We need but to refer to the miners' congresses, to the efforts of sailors and firemen to enter into direct communication with their fellow workers abroad, to the financial help given by the workers of one nation to those of another, by the Nottingham lace workers to the lace workers of Calais, by Calais to Manningham, by the English to the Lyon glass, glass blowers, by Austria to the brickmakers, and to the appointing at the suggestion of the GW and GLU of secretaries in all countries where the laws admitted of such appointments, who would be in communication with all other international secretaries. In Germany, Hungary and Austria, the appointing of such, sec such secretaries has not been possible, 
but the international correspondence has been undertaken by men who are willing and in a position to carry it out. Really direct links at class level, at union level, that she was sponsoring, she was organising. And, you know, I mean, the dock workers, the dock workers strike would not have succeeded without international help either. Australia paid lots of money towards these, the dock workers strike. So, okay. Cool. Ah, right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there's the uh, the great slogan. Which wouldn't it be wonderful if um, many workers today actually still had this um, eight hours labour, eight hours recreation, eight hours um, rest. Um, and it just brings to mind talking to some midwives yesterday on our health service store. You know, of them working twelve hour shifts with. Um, barely a toilet break, never mind a, 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 you know, a lunch break or other breaks. But the eight hour day was a fantastic victory of um, new unionism. And um, not all of the unions were necessarily totally on board initially uh, with that. And um, Eleanor Marx herself had to fight the, con the, you know, the conservatism with a small c of some of the uh, TUC unions. In fact, the TUC, didn't want to admit Eleanor Marx as a working woman to their Congress, even though she was elected by the, the women guest workers as a delegate. So she had to go to this TUC Congress as a journalist, which they obviously didn't regard as work. Um, so that, uh, because there was this element of the TUC, which as we know is still very conservative with small C, um, you know, an attitude of uh, at the time of organising the skilled workers and looking down on the so-called unskilled workers. But as Felicity said, the match workers laid down the basis for the dock workers and the dock strike took place. And there was a rally of 100,000 people at which Eleanor Marx was one of the speakers. And she was also, uh, the gas workers won their uh, their dispute and it really changed the, the working class movement um, in England and Ireland and Eleanor was one of the key organisers in establishing May Day as a universal workers day and she was funded by a number of the unions to speak all over the country um, agitating and building for the success of this and in May Day, the first official May Day of 1890 100,000 people were on a demonstration, and again, Eleanor was one of the, uh, you know, the, the key uh, speakers on um, on that. And of course, we still have the 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 tradition of May Day. But again, you know, that's one of the traditions that we need to revive because sometimes May Day is a little bit small, and it's the activists, etc. And obviously, you know, that whole. Uh, program and uh, struggle needs to be raised but May Day is still celebrated as we know all over the world and, and part of that is as a result of Eleanor Marx. So over to you Felicity. Okay. Sorry. Right. Um, we have to understand that in Europe at that time there were huge socialist movements with their own newspapers and often with representatives, elected representatives as well. Britain was way behind. Um, but she talks in this quote about how the, this is all part of the report to the Second International, about how there is the need for a Labour Party and how they are, be, or a Workers' Party, and how they're beginning to work in it. But it, it's the it's the link that we are familiar with, but it's interesting to see the way she puts it, that there's the socialists and the socialists kind of win the respect of the workers and through the respect of the workers, socialism becomes the ideology of the working class. Um, and the need to have a Labour Party, not just nationally, but representation in the smaller areas in the country. Like, you know, in the past, in working on history of teacher unions and the like, we've come across the fact that the very first place where women were allowed to take up an elected position was in the school boards. And the, 
if you look back, certainly in the history I've done in Liverpool, it's key. Some of the women involved in the history of Liverpool were very, very important that they were elected onto these smaller bodies to take the fight forward. Um, so this, she's talking here about the need for unionite union socialism the unions and the um socialism the union and the political representation and i think they're equally the problems that we're facing today leslie yeah thanks Lister. yeah absolutely um so in 1892 um the gas workers conference um uh, voted for standing uh, candidates in uh, local and parliamentary elections there have been quite a debate in some sections of the the movement about that but um a delegate meeting of people who'd helped to organize that 1890 May Day demonstration um, followed and they decided that a permanent organization should be formed. It should have its object uh, getting an eight hour working day and um, various other demands and the formation of a distinct Labour Party um, with the Paris resolutions for a minimum program and that affiliation of organized bodies of workers should be sought for rather than just of individual members and so in 1892 the gas workers took that forward and in fact Eleanor became in effect the gas workers organizer of the campaign to get Keir Hardy elected. Eleanor had previously worked with Keir Hardy anyway and uh, part of her speaking tours in, in Scotland were linked to um, to Hardy, who knew Th Thorne, etc. Um, and so, in effect, she was actually crucial in getting Keir Hardy elected as, um, at that time, independent Labour Party um, candidate. So, the next thing we're going to look at is, um, is women's rights. And that Eleanor lived lived at a time when women's lives were very circumscribed in, apart from both the poorest working in factories who actually had an income most of the rest of women were re really were very severely oppressed and um, there was a court case the queen versus charles bradlaugh and annie Besant, which was about the right to publish details of contraceptive methods and um, it was regarded as being um you know too appalling to even allow it to be published it was eventually published and she was involved in the work around that um she certainly knew of and supported that and she knew of and supported things like the right for women to wear comfortable clothes um not to be corseted the whole time um and she chose to live with a married man in defiance of society he was married whether or not he already he said his wife refused to give him a divorce um, but he wasn't a particularly good man her first love was i never can say his name right lisagori the hero of the commune but she was a teenager and he was uh, very much an adult and eventually that relationship broke up but edward aveling was her long-term partner and, and comrade but you know we'll go on to what actually happened with that in a minute um Leslie, do you want to do this one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so Eleanor Marx's um, mother had been very interested in, uh, in in drama before she married Marx, and the whole family was very interested in theatre. I mean, before Eleanor was brought up, before public schooling became um, a, a right for anybody, never mind women. Um, and, uh, you know, she was encouraged to read uh, Shakespeare, etc., and had a very wide-ranging if slightly chaotic education there was no school as uh, as such uh, for most women um and her mother uh, her mother jenny von westphalen you know she was 21 marx was 17 when they got engaged and you know she was a relative free thinker in many respects and of course she she knew marx as a childhood uh, friend of her brothers and uh, they got engaged and eventually married and then because of political events and uh, Marx's stance and Engel's stance, it ha she had to flee with him as a political 
refugee uh, to England and she did suffer extreme poverty and um, and ill health. But the love of literature, both from her mother and father, you know, as Felicity said before, uh, passed on and Eleanor translated Ibsen. And again, Ibsen was regarded as really outrageous, questioning the role of the family, questioning the role of women within the, um, the family. But Eleanor so, uh, taught herself Norwegian, so she could actually translate the uh, read and translate the, um, the work. And she did a lot of translation for many other uh, books, including Marx, the say Plekhanov as, as well. So Felicity, you can just do the next slide, thanks. So as we said, you know, the extreme um, poverty, when the, the Marxes arrived, they lived in really appalling rented uh, conditions and um, uh, as a result in the general mortality amongst, um, uh, you know, many people at the time, they lost five of their children, um, you know, which again was a really horrendous uh, blow, you know, some of the children only survived, you know, a year or less. Um, one of them died a little bit older. But at the time, it was figured that something like 25 to 35 percent of the population of London lived in absolute poverty. And many, many children died in uh, childhood, in, in infancy or childhood. And again, today, we actually, we don't have, uh, we now have in Liverpool, for instance, a quarter of the children at least live in um, in poverty. And although we don't have infant mortality at that rate, infant mortality is actually on the increase again after going down and maternal mortality is on the increase and it's directly related to the drive down of austerity and, uh, and, and living uh, conditions and also um, you know, cuts in the NHS and maternity. And we know that outcomes for maternity and infant mortality are absolutely dreadful in um, in America. So over to you, Felicity. Thank you. So Eleanor died by her own hand in suicide. She did suffer from depression, bouts of depression throughout um, her life. Um, there are many stories around as to what exactly happened, but certainly those generally believe that she and Aveling had a suicide pact and he did not go through with it. He had married someone else while he was still living with her. He had married someone else. Um, she, she'd lived with him despite the fact he was married, that he had a wife, he said wouldn't divorce him. When his wife died, he married someone else without Eleanor knowing. Um, and this is one of the reasons, apart from general stress and, you know, uh, and depression led to her suicide. And probably the extreme poverty of her childhood also damaged her health. Um, so she died in her 40s. She was young. She had wanted to have children and Aveling had not wanted them to have children until things were sorted. Um, so she, one of her regrets was that she hadn't had children, but she helped raise her nephew while her sister was dying of, can dying of, um, of cancer. So a fascinating, busy and very committed life. There are two standard biographies, the Eleanor Marx by Rachel Holmes, and Eleanor Marks by Yvonne Cap. Yvonne Capps is the older one and has two volumes, one of which goes into a lot of detail about her, child, her childhood. Um, I would recommend anyone who's interested in reading these three books, Strike a Light by Louise Raw. The book called The Five, which is not particularly directly political, it's about the lives of the five women who were killed by Jack the Ripper. It does not go at all into their deaths, how they died. It simply talks about their life. But it gives, in, it gives you a lot of information about how, for instance, the socialists worked. A lot of these women, at the time they were killed, were homeless and were street sleeping. But they were street sleeping, not in the way you see it now, where people street sleep in public. They would find a doorway, a, you know, a back doorway, a gate that gave them some shelter and sleep, sleep there. 
Um, but what the socialists did, particularly in Trafalgar Square, is they would have a trolley with coffee and some food that homeless people could go to. And they would do a collection to see how many tickets for the DOS house they could buy. So people would come to them, ask for that help, get the DOS house um, ticket if they had enough and were able to sleep indoors rather than outdoors. But there's also an issue where one of the women who were killed, her father had been a striker in um, the Midlands and had to and went to uh, to London to get work. The other members of the union in London helped him get work. He was then arrested for leaving his employment without the permission of his father, of his employer. So there's lots of bits and pieces about the trade unions, but certainly gives you the background to what it was like to live in London at that time. And D.P. Thompson's book um, on, on, on William Morris, some people just see the William Morris that the press give you, which is a designer of wallpaper. William Morris traced the country again and again and again, selling his socialist newspaper, building the socialist movement, talking to people, when leading some of the huge demonstrations in London. Um, he's, he's a comrade. It's very much important to, to people to know he's, he's important. And then this bit is about the stuff that she wrote herself. Um, a book about Shelley's socialism, Madame Bovary, a book called Thoughts on Women in Society, a translation of anarchism and socialism and um, the secret diplomatic history of the 18th century. Madame Bovary, I mean, Madame Bovary is the huge one and revolution and counter revolution. There is much more that she wrote, but these are just some of, of some of her writings. And I thought you'd like to see a bit in her own handwriting. Um, this is Eleanor Marks, a note from the house she lived in. After Engels had died and left her some money, she was able to buy a house in Jew Walk in Sydenham. I believe the house itself is still there. I don't know, but certainly there's a blue plaque in the street to recognise that's where she lived. And Leslie, the next bit. Yeah, just to um, just to finish off, obviously we still celebrate uh, May Day and it's celebrated internationally. And of course in Britain, we've got the rebirth of mass action in, um, in, in trade unions. And of course the key is still, you know, raising the socialist uh, programme and, you know, building towards a mass, socialist uh, party and interestingly just recently most of you probably have seen that um, a survey was done where a third of uh, people likely to um, to vote sample survey wanted an alternative to the mainstream parties of, of Tories and and Labour and other mainstream parties and really that's our hope for the um, for the future and you know we're still got to relearn and relive history in a different way but some of many of the uh, of the lessons and the battles that Eleanor Marx uh, fought is really fundamental part of the movement that took place in her lifetime. Thanks. So that's that's it from us folks. Well, I mean, a massive thank you. That was an absolutely brilliant presentation. Although I knew some of the stuff, I certainly didn't know all of it. I think it's just, you know, it's very well looking at your work, looking at your reading list and uh, learning a bit more about it. <laughs> so, yeah, that was, that was brilliant. Thank you very much. So would so anybody like to put their hand up and say something? Or ask a question? Peter Sinclair. Just a quick point. I'm just wondering, sitting here listening to what the girls have said, um, I wonder what Marx, uh, Alan, Marx and um, Will Thornwood thought about the present GMW, or GMB as we're now called. I've been a member of that, that union for almost 59 years this year. Um, well, I'm here as union, of course, not the GMW itself. I joined in 82. It's, uh, I've sat in various committees uh, in the Northern region. And believe you me, you might as well be sitting in the middle of a Tory party. And I suspect that will be the same throw. Mm -hmm. I've had rows with most of the leaders in the past, threatened to take legal action against one of them, John Edmonds, for allowing a, a thief to get away with stealing money from the Northern region. And uh, he did take action because I 
told him what I would do, get the Northumberland police involved. But um, I've got nothing good to say about the trade union movement, as you're probably well aware. Uh, not now, anyway. And especially my union, the German B, when I spoke in 85, after they had let the, the miners down in a disgusting way, along with many others, a strike that should have and could have and would have been won had the likes of, of the huge union, like the GMB, joined in and gave the Tories at that time a good kick in. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Who would like to speak next? Does anybody want to comment on what Peter said? Carol. Uh, I just, I have a, a question, maybe over time, you know, the more people talk, the more, you know, things will come up. But I read the book, Love and Capital, <laughs> it's about Marx and his family. And um, I mean, it was clear from the book that Eleanor Marx was this brilliant woman who spoke many languages, was completely invested in the struggle, but was so, so torn up by this relationship with Aveling that it just, she couldn't liberate herself, even though she was for, you know, liberation of women. And I'm wondering if you read the book and was, no, was her, I mean, if it, it was almost like, you know, you want to cry <laughs> while you're reading it about her because she was so, desperately in love with somebody who was such a horrible human being but couldn't break herself free and so while and and the author whose name I forgot spent a lot more time on her relationship with him than her relationship with the labor movement so I was wondering how much of that is you know really real and and how if anybody knew Probably quite a hard question to answer that. Felicity or Leslie, have you got any, any um, suggestions? <laughs> I think if you if you read, if you look at her life, either of the main um, biographies of her life or E.P. Thompson's work, the main impression you get is she was phenomenally busy, unbelievably busy. You know, the, the diary was, you know, completely packed and she worked herself you know relentlessly and she she had foul taste in men which is just a shame you know um but should she could she I don't know I I think it, it's it's a shame in a way that her death and how horrible he horribly he treated her um overshadows that a lot I've not gone into a lot of what she said what her own writings about women um and women's rights but you know, she was a fighter for women's rights. Um, but I, w I wish she, you know, <laughs> you do wish she'd been able to um, to get rid of him because she probably had another 20 years of work, 30 years of work she could have put into the movement and been a lot happier, but she didn't. That's life. Yeah, just just to come in on, on that, um, I haven't uh, read that book, so if you put it in the chat, that would be really uh, good, Carol. Um, okay. Yeah, she. It, yeah, I mean, it was a real irony that Aveling, you know, wrote, um, you know, with Eleanor about, um, you know, rights of women, etc. Um, but sadly, as sometimes in the um, you get in the movement, you know, you get society reflected in the movement, and um, you know, words. Uh, you know, words and action can be two quite different things. And obviously, she only found out about the um, that Aveling had married somebody else in the last two weeks of her life. And obviously, that does seem to have been, you know, part of a you know, a major contributory factor in her death. And also, there seems to be some evidence that Aveling was threatening um, Freddie Demuth, who was actually Marx's uh, son. Although he'd always been presented as, um, you know, Helen DeMuth, the house, uh, the, the Marx's housekeeper, it, it was her, uh, recognised as her son. Eleanor had always believed that he was Engel's son and only found out um, in the latter part of her life. But 
she only found out that um, Aveling was threatening to expose Freddie. And again, you know, it's a sign of the times that she wanted to protect her father's reputation mm-hmm. and that it was seen as, um, you know, a scandal because the Marxes, Helen DeMuth and Engels had all gone to their grave without that secret being um, revealed. And Eleanor had become quite close to Freddie, who was actually an ordinary um, worker. I think he was a rail worker. Um, but sadly, we still have um, various forms of, of and levels of abuse within the, um, you know, including within the movement, the working class and amongst other classes, uh, you know, today, because Aveling was obviously more and more interested towards the end of Eleanor's life as she became potentially more financially independent um, and had Engel's uh, inheritance that, you know, she could free herself from him and obviously he wanted to make sure that that didn't happen um, and again that's one of the things that we need to raise in International Women's Day you know we have to recognise that these different forms of abuse still go on today and that we're still uh, we're still fighting about it but obviously we don't know exactly what happened so um, you know but we do know that he was notorious and many of her friends didn't want to associate with Aveling, quite happy to associate with Eleanor, but didn't want to associate with Aveling because of various things that he'd done in the um, in the movement, you know, they noted his affairs and, um, you know, bad debts and all the rest of it. Um, so, you know, sadly, as Felicity said, that deprived the movement of potentially another 20, 30 years of brilliant work. Yeah, thanks, Leslie. It's the old battle between head and heart in a way, isn't it? But it's impossible to know what goes on in private relations, particularly all that time ago, to exactly get down to it. Well, welcome, Beverly. I presume it's you've got your hand up, not Joe. Would you like to come in now? Um, thank you, for John. <laughs> That's a bit... Sorry. Um, thank you for that. Really enjoyed. Uh, listening to that, I, I started um, reading the uh, one of the biographies, the uh, Yvonne Cat uh, biographies. I've read quite a bit of that. It's quite, there's quite a lot to it, um, and it's it was one of the things actually that started getting me interested in a subject that I've been researching uh, as part of a local history thing into um, domestic service. So. I'm glad you talked about that, um, about Helen, um, the, the housekeeper, um, mm. because that was something that um, started just sort of me make, making me think about um, that whole subject, really. Um, I think, uh, you know, they were living in uh, terrible poverty, as you said at, at that time. But I, I don't think it was probably it was um, Marx's Karl Marx's uh, finest hour, really. Um, I think perhaps you know the 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 boy was um, grew up elsewhere, and sort of Engels let people assume that he was the father. I think. Um, but, um, and I think it may have actually saved his life that because I think um, her, Eleanor Marx's mother had a baby around the same time that um, they, they tried to save by uh, letting it be nursed elsewhere, but it died anyway um, because it, they were living in such terrible conditions. Um, so, you know, it takes. It's not really fair to judge anybody, but uh, still, I think you should have had some awareness that that, that uh, the servant they were in, they were in a strange situation because they weren't working class in their background, no. um, and so they were used to having that sort of life where you would have a servant, um, but they were desperately poor uh, for part, particularly at that time. Um, but he should have understood that there was an economic power play there as well so um, if anybody was going to do at that time um, so it, that that is an interesting aspect of their lives and the fact that uh, you know she, Eleanor had an unusual upbringing obviously um, 
in the, this mixture of both poverty, but also the influence of, of uh, some of the advantages of, of a higher status being within their history. Um, and so it's interesting, you know, how, how um, she has resulted in being uh, such an effective uh, player as regards socialism and the development of the, of the workers' movement um, within, you know, in this country and, and internationally. Um, I think I'd, I would also say that um, that book, The Five, is, uh, is brilliant, and I would recommend that as well, that Felicity mentioned. Uh, the research that I'm doing, because I'm, I'm looking at um, women who were servants at a particular hair, a sort of a uh, a part of Huddersfield where I'm from, um, it was um, where all the mill owners lived and it was like this um, Victorian middle-class suburb. Um, and I'm kind of finding out where all the, the, the women that were servants there, what their stories are. And it's a fantastic way to find out about, about working class history and about women's history. Um, and, uh, you know, I've learned a lot from doing it because it's something that you don't learn a lot in, you know, we know normal, traditional history tends to talk about, you know, the rich and the, the people that influence things. Um, but, you know, labour movement history doesn't give you a lot of that either. Um, and the whole thing about domestic service, which was like absolutely a, a huge employer, it was 1901, it was the the largest employer um, in in England, which you know more than mining, agriculture, textiles, it was the biggest employer. And yet, you know, there's very little that you find in either socialist type literature or in um, you know traditional. So it is a, a fascinating subject. And um, another book that I'd, I'd actually recommend that I've read. Uh, while I've been researching all this, I don't know if you've heard of this one called Breadwinner uh, by Emma Griffin. And that looks at basically that subject really in history of the influence of who is the breadwinner and what influence that has had on ordinary people's lives and how they sort of played out in that kind of, uh, at this period when Ellen Marx um, was around so I would recommend that as well so thank you it was about Beverly anybody else I think there's one or two comments coming up in the chat I don't know whether the comrade concern would like to vocalize that <laughs> looking at her at the moment if not is there anybody else who'd like to come in can I say a bit about Helen de Muth? sure that when she after Marx's death she worked with Engels directly on Engels on Engels on Marx's papers. She she wasn't just a skivvy. She was an intelligent woman who could read many languages and could make her own socialist contribution to the movement. It's a you know when you it's very weird you know Eleanor Marx was good on contraception but you know maybe her dad should have been too. Um, but the um, but it it is. You know, it's a very complex issue and, and it's right to say just how they had this mixture of financial poverty and real poverty that did cause the death of some of the, um, sorry, my computer's about to run out, um, but I'll finish this and plug it in. Um, so it, it's a weird mixture, but Eleanor came out of it and um, became close friends with, with her, you know, half brother um, and, and, they did manage to cross over, you know, the, the, the strange mixture. He was probably, I would contend, this is me, in a better position to be well fed and brought up in a skilled working class household than in that chaos that they were living in. He probably survived to be, you know, he became a councillor, I think, a Labour councillor at some point. Um, but, you know, he was better off where he was than than being brought up in the Marx household. That's my opinion. Not not factual, just an opinion. Thanks, Felicity. Yeah, just a quick point on um, 
uh, on uh, Beverly's uh, something that Beverly said about you know domestic uh, service, and obviously Felicity said you know Helen's situation, Helen Demuth's situation was a bit different. I mean, she'd been very young when she first went to work for um, Jenny von Westphalen's mother. So she was, and she was almost like a family friend, and she was political in her, you know, her own right. And obviously, the strange pact of not to, um, you know, to take all this to their uh, to the grave. But on domestic service, um, interestingly, Eleanor Marx was a great advocate of the typewriter, and that was one of the key things in terms of new technology that she embraced, um, and and she did. Um, part of her living from typing things up and this is one of the reasons she was really good at writing reports and things because she embraced the typewriter. The typewriter was part of the kiss of death of uh, domestic care service because office work you know as well as other work became open to um, you know open to many uh, women and um, you know many women would much prefer to go and work in a, a you know in an office than uh, Skivvy for, um, for, you know, for somebody else. But just on um, Peter's point about the g &M, yeah, well, what we've seen, haven't we, over the, um, you know, more than 100 years is those new unions, um, like many of, the, you know, the TNG, uh, you know, uh, as well. It's a battle to reclaim the, the unions, you know, because the, those unions were set up on a democratic basis with mass involvement, mass strikes. I mean, you know, having rallies of 100,000 people, um, you know, amazing when you think of, the, of uh, you know, of the times. Um, but obviously part of the, the battle that we're facing is reclaiming the unions back by workers, for workers, you know, and obviously linking to modern demands like, you know, union officials should only be paid the average pay of their members. And obviously there's still battles to be had because although some of the unions are, you know, have been pushed by their members into action, you know, you've seen that some of the unions may be creaking at the edges and subject to pressure about calling off strikes, etc. So all of that battleground is is you know, is thrown up again, isn't it, either in some of the newer trade unions but, or in some of the more traditional trade unions that go back to those uh, days. Thanks, Pam. OK, thanks, Leslie. One characteristic, we've got a lack of men speaking today. Don't don't be shy. I'm sure there are, <laughs> there's lots you want to ask us. <laughs> Carell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks. And thank you, uh, Leslie and Felicity. It was really fascinating. Um, I'd like to recommend a book if you're interested in um, the sort of background to the sort of poverty that was being faced by people like Eleanor Marx um, and others in the East End of London around the time that she was um, organising this, this book called The Blackest Streets by um, Sarah Wise. And it focuses on... 15 streets which were highlighted as black um, because of the dire poverty and it goes into the lives of the people that are living there it's a really really interesting background if you if um, history is your thing so I'd just like to say something about the match women um, I have read the book Strike a Light and um, every year there's um, a big thing at the Bryant and May match factory which is now luxury flats of course in east london um but there is a celebration um with speeches etc um and louise raw is often there what is interesting about louise raw is that she individually um looked at the women who were active i mean it, it, you know i for a long time but even though i've got a history degree i thought it was annie besson who organized the match women not realizing that annie besson wasn't even a match woman <laughs> she was a <laughs> philanthropic well-off journalist in the fabians and um actually the women organized themselves um but they were mainly irish women and jewish women and that's the interesting thing about it and there would have been no dockers strikes without the organisation of those women who led the way. Um, 
so yeah women are really very very hidden from history and of course the places like liverpool the east end of london and other places have got a rich rich history in this so i'm very interested in what um uh, the work that um, Beverly's doing, I think that's fascinating. Finding out about what's going, what, what, how women were employed as domestic ser servants and um, and were exploited as domestic servants as well. So yeah, women are hidden from history. So uh, in this bit of London where um, Eleanor Marx was operating, there were other women as well who were. Perhaps not as well known. Well, they're certainly not as well known, but were equally as important. Uh, I'm going to show you a picture. This is a picture of Adelaide Knight, who was born in 1871 and she died in 1950. And she's with her husband, Donald Adolphus Brown. And he was a, um, a worker at the gas works in Beckton. He was a member of the GMB and he was a great hero because he saved hundreds of people's lives um, for an act of bravery by um, uh, making sure that they left the factory when he thought there was going to be an explosion. And there was the famous Beckton gaswork explosion. But he managed to get hundreds of people out. But um, Eliza Adelaide Knight, or Adelaide Knight as she's called, has got no plaque to her anywhere. And she lived in what is now Newham, but was, at the time was West Ham. She's a founder member of the British Communist Party and was started off on the school boards, just like has been mentioned, and then went on to, um, to become a leading suffragette with people like Sylvia Pankhurst. So my question is really, I know Sylvia Pankhurst and Eleanor Marx most probably didn't overlap, I wouldn't have thought, but I'd like to have known what, Eleanor Marx's direct views were on women's suffrage and was she involved in any of the earlier movements pre, you know, what the Pankhursts uh, actually set up? Uh, thanks, Carell. Do you, do you want to come back on that, Leslie, or Felicity? I, I would, it's one of the things that's very sad about the idea of um, Eleanor Marx dying prematurely that she wouldn't have been, she wasn't able to work with with the Pankhurst and she wasn't able to work with Rosa Luxemburg. Um, but she, you know, had she lived, we would have had that in you know, a wonderful set of um, of people working together. I don't know. I would need to look it up to see exactly what she would say about the suffrage movement. Um, but she definitely thought that women should have equal political rights to what extent she was involved in it. I literally don't know. I'd need to check. Leslie might know. I'd need to check that one up. Um, but yeah, I mean, Sylvia Pankhurst is about, she she would have been younger, they might have met, but she would have been a lot younger than than um, than Eleanor Marx. Yeah, they, they actually they actually met in Manchester. Mm -hmm. at, um, but Syl Sylvia was only 13, but she was mightily impressed with Eleanor Marx. Sylvia was uh, with her father, um, and mother Richard Pankhurst, who, who was um, obviously involved in the, you know, the women's suffrage uh, movement um, in the earlier days. So Sylvia was only very young, um, and there was a reception held um, in honour of um, Liebknecht, who was uh, on tour with the, with um, Eleanor um, and Edward Aveling, and. Um, the Pankhurst were there, so and Sylvia met her and was mightily impressed with her. But as Christy said, slightly different political generation because Sylvia was only thirteen mm. at the um, at the time. But you know, um, you know, she was very impressed with her. But their paths probably didn't uh, didn't really cross then because sadly Eleanor, you know, would have uh, would have been dead before. Sylvia really was, um, you know, was st starting to get uh, totally involved. And, and obviously Sylvia then went on from the idea of the women's vote, but back in the East End. So she was, you know, continued, Sylvia continued that tradition of organising working class women in the um, in the East End. And that would have been wonderful to, for them to um, have done that together. But obviously it wasn't to, um, to be. Uh, Eleanor did make friends with uh, people like Clara Zetkin, 
Um, but obviously, again, she wasn't around in, um, you know, in Rosa, Lux in Rosa Luxemburg's uh, time. I think the other thing we should remember, given we're celebrating International Women's Day, is Engels' wives, or non-wives, the women that lived with Engels, who um, were truly revolutionary and prepared to um, hold up stagecoaches to free Fenian prisoners in Manchester. Um, you know, they, they you know, we, we celebrate the Burns sisters as well as celebrating Eleanor Marx. And if I did this again, I'd put a slide in about the Burns sisters. But uh, they were working class women and they were sequentially the life partners of, um, of, of Frederick Engels. OK, thanks for that. I'll, I'll try and post a link if people don't know it to the um, to the hijacking, the Fenian fella on his way to be executed. And uh, it's, it's one of the better stories in uh, yeah. <laughs> in our history. I was just about to say, Ash, I think if anybody wants to post any extra info or send us the reading list, I'd quite like to publish this on the Women's web page with the, and on YouTube with the recording, you know, because there's obviously an awful lot of interesting material there. And the other thing I was going to say, as a Mancunian myself, that Manchester has absolutely wonderful socialist history. I did, I did a few years ago go on a, a, an Engels tour and we were taking around all the sites where where everything happened and also a place like the Pankhurst Centre. If anybody's ever in Manchester, they should give it a visit. But I'll shut up now and bring Carol in. Mm -hmm. Carol, are you ready to go? I am. Although I think Finn was before me. It was after, but I'll let him go first if you want. Get Finn. Gentlemen I'll go before ladies and all that. <laughs> Do you want Finn to go first? It, well, oh, let me just qu quickly say that yeah, it, this this book, um, Capital and, and Love and Capital, really was very impacted me a lot. I mean, it was clear that Eleanor Marx was amazing. She spoke all those languages. She did all the things that, you know, in terms of mobilizing and, and helping her father. And But, I mean, it's sort of, points to, and I think it's still true, that there's a special oppression of women. And it's not just about women and men organizing unions or organize, which I'm absolutely for, and for organizing for revolution, which I'm absolutely for. But she was stuck mentally in, or had this dichotomy, because on one hand, she was this brilliant fighter. And on the other hand, she was definitely an impressed woman. And Aveling, from the book, from what I could see, took profound advantage of her. And rather than being able to break away and saying, you know, screw you, I'm on my own, she was unable to do that, which ultimately led to her depression and demise. And I think it's important for our movement to keep in mind that women are, you know, especially oppressed. And it's not just about fighting for equality, but it's also fighting to, to understand that women are in that position and we have to do things to make sure that women, you know, participate and that women are, are have, you know, that we fight for rights that in ourselves that, that, you know, women don't have, that we have to keep in mind that there is a real oppression of women besides women being oppressed by capital and by the bosses. That was Carol. Ben. Thank you, Carol, for the offer to come in before you. Anyway, I want to thank Felicity and Leslie for a tremendously informative and very, very interesting opening contribution. So, contributions. The, the point I want to make relates to the Fenian question, which Felicity has just alluded to. I was interested to see the association between Eleanor Marx and Fenianism. Incidentally, the event that Alyssa referred to, the attempt to free a prisoner from a prison van in Manchester, uh, led to the execution of three people whose surnames were Alan, Larkin, and O'Brien. In the attempt to free the prisoner, a police sergeant in the van was shot and killed. And Fenianism, which I just want to make a couple of comments about, uh, arose in Ireland in the 1860s as an attempt to free Ireland 
Don't control and it was linked also to America. A lot of the Fenian leaders were actually amongst the Irish immigrants in America. But the association of Fenianism and the revolutionary movement in Britain at the time is interesting because the first international support, uh, incidentally, a lot of Fenians were arrested and imprisoned in England. And there was a, a bombing by the Fenians in Clerkenwell Prison in London in which a number of civilians died in the explosion outside the prison. Houses that were nearby died in the explosion. And a lot of Fenians were in prison, but the First International campaigned for the release of political prisoners, which wouldn't have been an easy thing to do under these conditions at the time, during the death of the police sergeant in Manchester, for which three men were executed. And also killing the civilians who were living in poor accommodation in the vicinity of the explosion of the prison. And I, I want to comment also on Marx's individual approach to this question of Fenianism, which emerged as a revolutionary movement. Now there was a Fenian uprising in Ireland in 1867, which was a complete and absolute failure. There was no uh, coordinated event. Most of the leaders were in prison shortly before. The event collapsed and ended up the, the only uh, event of North during the Fenian uprising was really an attack on a police station. In a rural area. And was, the, the traditions of Fenianism continued on throughout up to the uh, time of the uh, independence movement. So the tradition of Fenianism was well established. But anyway, Marx's own position, Marx's original argument about the uh, Irish independence was that the program of the left party should be for Irish independence. But then he changed that position, and he made it quite explicit in his later works, not just that you should campaign for such a, an event, but that the freedom, freeing of Ireland from England, or the independence of Ireland from England, was a condition for the success of the revolution in Britain. But his arguments weren't emotional or sentimental or nationalistic. His arguments were, in what way does the uh, independence of Ireland help the British working class. First of all, it would have, repre would have represented the defeat of landlordism, which in the 1860s was very strong, a very strong political current in, uh, well, not really current dominant uh, in England. And the landlords in Ireland uh, would have been kicked out, obviously, of their positions had independence been secured. He also said that because of the position of British control or English control in Ireland, Lots of Irish workers had to emigrate and work in England. And by working there, they work for much lower pay, a bit like happens now with some immigrant workers who are condemned to work for low pay because of the conditions in the society they've arrived in. And the lowering, the, the fact that Irish labourers in Britain were paid less than British workers would have been, this then weakened the British working class, a further argument for Irish independence. He also then said that in addition to that, there were divisions along... Please stop winding up, comrade, please. We've got all the hands up, sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. Yeah, okay, I will. So, anyway, I'm just making the point that Marx's arguments applied to the conditions at the time and wouldn't... These arguments don't, obviously, stand today, so we don't take the thing literally. But anyway, I just wanted to comment on the issue of feminism, which Eleanor Marx was closely associated with and its revolutionary potential. Thank okay, you. thanks, Finney. Of course, what we what would be interesting to know is how women were disproportionately affected by uh, by that as well. Uh, David Hempson. Yeah, excuse me, not uh, appearing. It's very hot here, and uh, I'm not well dressed. Let me put it that way. Um, and apologies, first of all, uh, you know, for not not hearing what I understand was a really excellent uh, lead off, uh, Felicity and Leslie. I just want to make some uh, comments, you know, in, in relation to the relationship with Abilene. Um, You know, I remember seeing a BBC production in 1977 or 8, and it showed that, you know, Evelyn really abused Eleanor and that he insisted on her taking poison with him and that she wanted to get out and, and so forth. I was watch, I watched this um, documentary, and I'm not quite sure how true it is, 
uh, together with a, a South African Stalinist, and he said it was absolute trash and was all wrong and so forth. But I do think that there are very difficult relationships politically between uh, men and women who are in a mutual relationship. Um, first of all, there's the stress of the work, which isn't always rewarding. And secondly, when there is a disappointment in perspectives, it is seen that the male has put this forward, and this is a prediction of the future. And when it doesn't work out, um, you know, divorce is, is sort of inevitable. Um, and I noticed that at the center and militant, a uh, very few marriages actually lasted any any length of time. <laughs> And you know the uh, this you know it's just a, a, a lot of debris you know in terms of relationships. I never thought that it happened to me, but uh, it did happen, and it was all linked to uh, imprisonment and uh, poverty, and and another point which is uh, the care of children. You see, because in a sense, when you marry, you create a nest, you you create a basis on which you're creating mutual support to be able to, you know, a new, new life to emerge. And that new life to be young revolutionaries has got a completely different outlook on society. And that's that's not uh, easy to achieve under the stress of, uh, you know, uh, you know, really urgent uh, political, you know, political struggle. So, you know, I do think that there's there's a question which needs to be explored arising from Evelyn's relationship with um, Eleanor to understand how you know women are dominated uh, politically in those relationships and in my experience in our South African section uh, we were reluctant to take on uh, you know women as full members for this reason that if you're a partner were you just agreeing for the sake of agreeing or did you actually really understand those issues it was quite a it was quite a difficult uh, you know decision to make um, because you know, the, the personal and the political is, is what feminists say is fused. Uh, and in a way it is, in a way it isn't. I mean, women have, should have a complete autonomy in, in terms of political conviction, but then also say if they do not have, you know, agree with their partners. And then again, it's very difficult with uh, children uh, because uh, you want children to have an independent uh, upbringing and to actually make decisions for themselves, or are you going to indoctrinate them and, and uh, this is what my I was accused of, <laughs> uh, with uh, you know very scary stories of of revolution and bloodshed and all the rest of it, which is very frightening to children. And actually, is you know is not uh, you know you want to create a sense of ease and uh, nurture uh, in in uh, a child growing up. You do not want to tell them the revolution is imminent and and there's going to be a bloodshed and there's going to be a complete disruption of society because actually it's it's very worrying and and kids stay up all night worrying. That's what I was told uh, when I when I talked politically with with my sons. Uh, you know, at times when you had a civil war here in in, in Natal and a lot of my people around me were dying. So you know, these are difficult difficult things. Now. Just in relation, I've put a post up in relation to domestic services. It's by no means an abstract question in South, South Africa. Um, white families all have uh, domestic servants, almost without exception. And black families too now, not just the middle class, but even working class families, so that if you go to work, you need a woman to be behind you to do that. Usually it's a grandmother. But uh, often it's a, it's a young woman who's brought from the rural areas and then stands and denies herself education so that she can look after children of the middle class and so forth, usually on a very low uh, wage. But then they do get accommodation and young, young women want safe accommodation in the city. And so this is the easiest way to get accommodation is to become a domestic servant, actually to live in the house. Uh, and of course, that's that's really, uh, you know, not a very good situation at all for the personal development of that, uh, you know, the person who's doing doing the work. Just the last thing in relation to uh, Sylvia Pankhurst, I was in Ethiopia and I couldn't, you will not believe the way in which she's regarded as someone who died just yesterday. Um, Ethiopians actually adore her and there are uh, statues there. I think she was actually buried in Addis, you know, Addis yeah. Ababa. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's a tribute to, to uh, women who broke with a whole history of imperialism, and uh, and Sylvia, you know, was 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 lauded uh, particularly in Africa 
for her stand. I don't know how much it was appreciated elsewhere, uh, but uh, you know that that is a living tribute, you know, to someone who is, you know, in Britain uh, when there was a lot of skepticism about any British people uh, being a, a woman and committed to let's say, the uh, struggle against fascism and the uh, commitment to Africa being able to have autonomous development, uh, you know, that that was something to be noted. That's not very well known. It should be more widely known in Britain and internationally. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, David. That was very interesting, thinking about myself to the uh, 70s and 80s. I know out of the, the many couples in the militants in Manchester, I think there was only one that survived long too. <laughs> but I think maybe some of the comrades... <laughs> set the bar, some of the female comrades set the bar higher as a result of their, you know, understanding of uh, the position of women in society. Would anybody else like to come in? We've had two men. Would any more like to speak? No? Leslie or uh, Felicity, do you want to come back on anything that's been said? Yeah. Um, I, want, I want to say something about what David's just said. It's very, very important that we recognize that Eleanor Marx is Eleanor Marx. The fact she had a daft fella is, you know, is beside the point. Mm -hmm. She was a giant of the movement. You know, her father created the theory. She put it into practice for the first time. The working class in England became a political entity. And, you know, that's a, a giant achievement. When you look at the, um, you know, and, and when it, International Women's Day, we are celebrating women. We're celebrating, it was a working class women's, the, the first name of International Women's Day was the International Day, uh, International Working Women's Day. Um, and, you know, the, the slogan of we want bread and roses too um, was, was very important. Um, women have a right to a life that's not just drudgery, that's got fun and pleasure and the arts and all the rest of it going in, as does, as do every, does every human being, but it's women that have, have been denied that. And that's what we've got to fight for. Um, and, you know, we can look at great, you know, with great admiration at some of the brilliant women that went before us. Um, you, you know, I'm, we can only, I'm only naming a handful, but if you just look at, We've got the war situation now where people seem to have forgotten the basics of internationalism when it comes to war and anti-war things. The Rosa Luxemburg position, Rosa Luxemburg's magnificent position in terms of war and all the work she did in terms of building the working class organisation in Germany. Clara Zetkin, um, Pankhurst, Sylvia Pankhurst, rather than her rather peculiar mother, and, uh, and Eleanor Marx, and many, many others. You know, there is a strong tradition of working class socialists, working class women that we celebrate. And the, we'll celebrate it, whatever the fellas say. We're going to, we'll celebrate that, we'll celebrate that history. Um, I think the, you know, Engels had an interesting point that when women, when in the working class house, in the working class relationships, that was the only time when it was a genuine love relationship, when love decided whether or not they'd live together. Economic factors came in with all the other classes, classes and decided who could marry who and when they could marry and all the rest of it. It was the only freedom was in amongst the working class women. And there's, there's comments from Jenny von Westphalen being very sarky about his attitude. Um, that it's only in working class women's, uh, only in working class families you see this element of love. But it's it's an issue that's there. And I honestly don't think we should be too, in remembering what she did and learning the lessons for today of what she did. I don't think we should let that be clouded by what happened to the twerp she happened to be married to or not married to. Thank you. <laughs> Leslie. Thank you, Felicity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just, just on that. I mean, you know, it's just at the point where Eleanor could become financially independent thanks to Marx's inheritance. You know, she managed to get a little house and uh, what have you. Um, you know, Aveling practiced financial abuse and basically was taking her money, and he wanted to survive Eleanor in order to get her property and her 
and money. Fortunately, he wasn't able to try and get his hands on the the, the you know the inheritance of the uh, Marx uh, papers, etc. But ironically, Aveling died four months later. He was actually um, he'd been quite ill and people weren't sure whether he was really ill or whether this was the excuse to go off and see the um the real wife allegedly but um part of Aveling's problem was that he didn't like being outshone by Eleanor Marx she, she, she was such a brilliant speaker and also she was recognized as so lively intelligent made a huge impression on um, on people and let's face it we've still we've still got people in the movement who perhaps um you know who liked to be the, uh, the the star. But the point about Eleanor, she was absolutely committed, not just to the ideas, but as Felicity said, putting them into um, into practice and really building stuff. And she she lived the life. I mean, she didn't spend money on clothes and all the uh, fripperies that um, Aveling was um, interested in. Nowadays, we may have, uh, you know, mental health is uh, is an issue and at times Eleanor may have suffered from mental health but the suicide was definitely linked to Aveling but I think the as Felicity said we shouldn't let that overshadow she did a fantastic amount of work and her whole life was summed up from getting arrested uh, going to help her sister with her sister Jenny she was going to help her sister Laura getting arrested she was you know probably about mid mid teens 16 17 um at the fall of the uh, the Paris Commune in the south of uh, France, going across the French-Spanish uh, border, um, you know, right through to those massive industrial uh, movements and the second uh, international. But we do have to recognise, as Carol said, you know, there is still a special oppression of women, and we have to understand that and take practical measures to, um, you know, uh, to do that in organising in the um you know not just in the movement generally but also in our own movement you know you know, crashes etc making meetings accessible for women and i think you know the pakistan comrades have shown you know built in the tradition of eleanor marx that you can organize the so-called unorganizable the home workers is a fantastic example of work that can be um that can be done today and i'll just take up finn's um point that Eleanor was, uh, you know, started wearing green in, um, you know, in sympathy, but she actually developed and came to a, a, you know, totally agree with Marx's conclusions about that the British working class had to be free themselves from their own ruling class um, in relation to Ireland, uh, you know, and other countries in order to become a class for, you know, of itself, struggling for itself and, you know, that internationalism. Again, that's something that we really have to revive because the British Labour movement still suffers terribly from that inward looking, um, you know, Britain's, uh, British, you know, analysis first and lack of internationalism when we, and we really have to build on that. And, that, you know, that direct action and direct solidarity that Eleanor helped organise again, you know, it's another major thing that, um, you know, we have to carry that, you know, really raise it that uh, you know raise the standard on because there's a lot of talk in the trade union and labor movement but it isn't always carried out into the practical day-to-day solidarity that people like Eleanor um you know carried and um, carry forward and put into practice so say we we mourn her death but we should absolutely celebrate her, her life what a fantastic um you know the background to all that was going on, but she was involved in every single part of it in the uh, in the struggle and recognised as that, absolutely recognised as that. You know, being uh, acclaimed by the the, the um, shop assistants wrote to her to ask her to come and organise them. You know, the dockers invited her to come and speak at meetings of a hundred, the rallies in the Hyde Park for a hundred thousand. Um, the dock, you know, the guest workers, etc. You know, so uh, but she wasn't just the speaker. You know, she did the dirty work as well, the bra- the grassroots work and the, the day-to-day uh, work and solidarity work. And that's what we have to remember and, uh, you know, maintain that tradition and celebrate that tradition. Thank you, Leslie. I just want to say something. There's no hands up at the moment. I've noticed in the chat people referring to women who are murdered by their romantic partners at 
it's an absolutely horrendous, um, horrendous number of people. Uh, I didn't realise till I went to an exhibition in a church in Newcastle, and they had an exhibition of a pair of shoes. There was a, they went round like in a big spiral sort of thing, and it was a pair of shoes for every woman I think that had been murdered that year. And I was absolutely appalled until I saw that. I don't think I even understood myself, you know, the extent of what happens when women fail to fit in with whatever men think they should be doing. And, um, you know, it, at least to actual murder, not seem discrimination, but actually being deprived of your life. Uh, I was having a conversation with somebody the other week and she'd been through a series of violent marriages. And there was one, uh, her first husband had actually banged her head against a wall and then sat, poured petrol out the house and set fire to it in an attempt to destroy everything that was there. Uh, I mean, fortunately, it, it, she put a stop to it. But, you know, it's just appalling when you actually people actually sit down and tell you what goes on the actual violence that takes place in private um, without, you know, even getting into the workplace. I just wanted to mention that, really, because it is something we haven't particularly gone into um, in, in this discussion. Maybe we could argue that, uh, you know, indirectly Eleanor Marx was murdered if you look at the actual situation she was, she was living in. Would anybody else like to say anything or ask any question? You don't have to say a lot, just something brief will be okay. Ian. Ian, did you want to speak? You had your hand up. Maybe it was a mistake. <laughs> We'd like you to speak. I know you did once come to a women's discussion group that we had. <laughs> Anybody else at all? We've still got time. Okay. Nobody else like to ask anything else. We've still got 25 minutes of discussion time left. No? Well, in that case, I'll just ask Leslie and... Um, Listen if they just like to sort of discussion up and for a few minutes each, if that's possible. Okay. Thank you. It's been a really good um it, it, I enjoyed doing the presentation. I thought it was, you know, really interesting to try and put it together. And you know, it makes you feel better. It makes me feel better having realized, you know, how good she was and all the work she did, but particularly that it's relevant today. That we're trying to or we're trying to bring people back into real trade unionism, not just paying the dues, but being involved and more and more people being involved in that action. And probably more people have been involved in strike action in the last couple of months than in I haven't seen the figures, but in decades. It's certainly since you know the the the, the, pen, the last pet set of pension uh, strikes, but basically, you know. The working class is coming back onto the arena of history. We've, we're actually in a worse situation in terms of class representation politically than when Eleanor was working. You know, there's a hand, it'd be brilliant if someone could organize them. There's a handful of good left wing councillors across the country. You know, um, we don't know how many, they just spot up every now and again. You'll suddenly see someone who's actually trying to do their best as a councillor. There's a probably smaller handful of good, of good MPs. Um, and we face the possibility, if Starmer has his way, of virtually all the socialist MPs being removed. And that would leave the working class with less political representation than even before Eleanor Marx, because during Eleanor Marx's time, there were at least the sort of the liberals who came from the, um, the more um, skilled sections of the working class and where had some genuflection in the direction of labor and so we've got we're in a very similar situation and we've also got to remember that there is nothing you know you can't have liberation in one country on its own there has to be internationalism and all the pressure that um that's happening now you know to from the right against migrants, against, you know, to push the issues of racism. You know, all of that is um, 
is there as a pressure towards the right. We seriously stand the chance of having less political representation than before Eleanor Marx. Now, it doesn't mean that there's not a mood there. I mean, you know, Roger tells me there's a really good response to the socialist labour things in Newham. I do a lot of street stuff, um, street campaigning for the NHS, and it, it gives you a boost. It gives you the energy to keep going, listening to what people think. There's a mood there amongst the class, and that's got to be organised. And in, an International Women's Day is international. It's women, and it's about working class women and working class women fighting. And young women are immensely radical. Um, and we, we socialists are finding it hard to organise those young women. It's something that, you know, we, we it's a problem. But Eleanor Marx gives us something we can look at and learn from and celebrate. And I think, you know, there's a lot of other ways in which we can celebrate it and not just be, you know, miserable about um, about the movement. It's it's something that she's a, an example that's worth looking at. Um, and the socialist movement's got to look at it. We should. I agree with what's been said about the issue of women in society, that that needs to be examined as well that you know the the fact that women's work in raising children women's work in protecting the community is a huge piece of work which is not only undervalued it's directly attacked um by by capitalism and is you know looking what happened in the states over basic rights being taken away from women we do need to discuss, socialists do need to discuss that as well. But what we've done this for is basically to give people a boost to say, we've got this fantastic history. They did it with so much less resources than we've got. Although we wouldn't mind having an Engels to give us loads and loads of money for doing the work we've got to do. You know, it's, we can learn and be enthused by what Eleanor Marx was able to do. And by you know, all the other women that people have mentioned and haven't got round to mentioning. So thank you for listening to that. Thanks, Felicity. So Leslie, Leslie, do you want to make a few oh. words, save you, then I'll, I'll then just ask to discuss Silvana because she's got her hand up. If well, you'd like to make your I, comments I, first. I was just going to say, bring Silvana in and um, first. Because Silvana's got yeah. Silvana, do you want um, to come in now? I, I'm just going to leave my camera off because uh, I cannot, I'm driving. So um, I think uh, it's very hard to, to say anything about her personal life because uh, a woman, they want to be happy. They want to get married. They want to have children. And that's not their fault. I think since you are a baby, you the father, the mother, have the child, and they are already planning uh, what they want for that child. And once that child goes to school, all this pressure, all this uh, learning, you know, is like a conditional learning that uh, they go to the um, to adulthood, think that they would be happier if they have a partner or a husband or children. So I think uh, what she done is amazing. Went to fight for women's rights. Um, killing herself, suiciding is like more uh, mental health issues that probably that time people were not concerned or thought that, uh, you know, it was not something that, um, uh, especially a worker woman. I mean, whether she would go to talk about her feelings, about her doubts, about her uh, goals, and she didn't have no support in the house. So I think uh, we um, perhaps learning more about her, we can make a difference in, in today's society. Um, I mean, uh, I forgot when she, she, she died, but uh, we look at the woman, to, woman today, we have so much issues in our hands. Yeah, uh, you know, we now we are fighting for equality, um, abortion, and the uh, far right wing is trying to take everything from us. So Wednesday is a good opportunity for us to go there and march in our fight, we continue to fight. 
And uh, I think in the end, we're going to uh, be able to see more opportunities for women. We, and we think about democracy, you know, uh, because democracy is like a language, the life. We cannot uh, count on uh, that our democracy is done. No, every day is a fight. Every day that we can talk to someone about our rights, uh, we, I think we are making a difference in the world. So thank you for the speakers. Oh, that's great. Thanks very much, Silvana. Anybody else quickly, or should we let Leslie have the final, final few words? <laughs> okay, Leslie. <coughs> okay, oh, thanks for coming in, Silvana. You know, the, this question of um, domestic abuse goes on in every part of the um, the world. It can take different forms, different cultures, honour killings, etc. Um, but the abuse of women, we still have that specific oppression of, um, of women and domestic abuses is one form of that as well as the economic um, abuse by the employer. Um, I think I think it was Trish that said it's at least two women a week has actually gone up slightly. And uh, during the COVID lockdown, um, one of the terrible side effects of that lockdown was that many women were trapped quite often in, in uh, you know, a small house with the abuser and there was a close down of a lot of services. The refuges and um, help phone lines were absolutely overwhelmed with, um, you know, with calls for help. And as we see, you know, back in Eleanor's day, the idea of, a, you know, an independent wage, the idea of getting somewhere safe and stable and affordable to live in, um, proper, proper quality childcare, uh, proper the right of access, proper access to education, um, contraception, etc. All of these things are, you know, under threat. But women are actually fighting for them. And um, you know, in, in the UK now, we have the most expensive childcare in um, in Europe. Um, and we've seen that austerity has pushed women's work, you know, women's living standards. Uh, down and of course that's one of the reasons why the, the NHS workforce which is roughly 80% women why nurses have voted to come out and strike and some of those young women on the picket lines you know tremendous lively and um, lively funny really full of fight but obviously the key issue is turning that fight one into a success so that they win the strikes and two making the link um, you know uh, politically about how to transform being on strike, as Eleanor Marx said, being on strike in industrial struggle isn't enough on its, um, you know, on its own. But at least some of those young women have been on picket lines, and it's a real, you know, a real education for um, for people. And Felicity's put in the in the um, in the chat, you know, about getting women out of a bad domestic situation. Back in the uh, when people like me and Felicity were in the um, in the militant. A number of us were involved in setting up a campaign on domestic um, violence when it was being, you know, first raised as an issue um, in the Labour movement. And, um, you know, obviously austerity and local government cuts and cutting money for refuges, all of those issues, you know, link into the, the whole period of uh, austerity in the ruling class trying to take things um, take things away a tax on benefits a tax on universal credit and I think that's where we've got to say to people you know we anywhere in the world the ruling class have got wealth beyond imagination and they just want to keep taking more and more of it and what we stand for is taking that wealth for ordinary people and back in the hands of ordinary working class people including um, you know including women and as Felicity said you know bread and roses really sums up you know women want um, the socialists we want a life for people decent work we want to have pleasure we want to have fun we want to have education arts we want our life outside of um, work and we want our children to have a decent um, a, a decent future in every part of the um, the world 
and that's really something that uh, you know we celebrate Eleanor Marx's life for because she raised all of these issues in her own way. Okay, thanks, Leslie. I think that's kind of the end of the discussion. Carell has just asked to play this song. I don't know if you've got link to it, but I just just wanted to say in conclusion that. Um, the root problem of all this, of course, is the capitalist system, this sort of violence and division and, and, and um, oppression of one group of people by another is all endemic to the, the uh, profit making system. And as Marxists, we've got to keep that at the centre of the way we look at things. Um, that's all I really wanted to say, you know, we've got to sort of, that's got to be the central thing, really. But uh, right, I'm going to stop now. Uh, are you wanting to play this song, Carell? Have you got a, a link to it or somebody? I can't, I, I can get a link to it, but I can't put it on this machine. I don't know why. Um, if you just Google it, because... Um, put put it in the chat, see, can, see, can one, see, can, see if yeah. one of us I'll put it up. That would be really good. Okay, while well, you're think, doing that, yeah, sorry. I'm just going to say one of the key uh, lines of it is about we are marching, marching, we're marching to for men. Well, they're women's absolutely... children and we mother them again. That's right. And it's absolutely <laughs> brilliant, that line. <laughs> so if we can get it, it'd be really good. Who's looking for it? <laughs> I can't look for it because I can't. It's called Bread and Roses, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, and it's on YouTube and it's Rochelle Lockridge is the best one. And there's several on there. Bread and... What's but... her name? Michelle? Rochelle, Rochelle Lockridge. Right. Sorry, say to... it again. Rochelle Lockridge. See, can I get it off? No. Yes, Just... the best graphics. That's the reason why I, I suggested that one. That's it. Okay. Let's see if I can share my screen. Jolly good. This is it. Mm. Can you see it? Yeah. Can't hear anything though. No, no oh. sound. What's wrong with this? Well, at least it's subtitled. <laughs> yeah. Just a shame we can't get the tune. Um, and that's a beautiful tune, isn't it? Yes, Again, if you could send send the link uh, to Roger or myself, we can uh, post it with mm -hmm. so that we can post it with the um, video of the meeting. I just take down the. Uh, yes, you can't see the words. <laughs> Yeah. Sorry. That's excellent. Mm -hmm. We'll have to yeah, learn how to how to share the um, <laughs> learn how to share this music too. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs>
Well, thanks very much for producing that. So that's obviously really, really good. I think a, a really good discussion today. We should be discussing yeah. this a lot more often, in my opinion. Um, okay. Roger, can we go to you for next week's meeting, please? Uh, I'd like to say, first of all, um, I don't know about the music, but I'd love to hear it, but the words of that song are absolutely beautiful. And uh, thanks for sharing them. Also, thank you very much to Felicity and Leslie for, uh, and for everybody who participated in one of the best meetings I can remember. It was really, really inspiring discussion. Um, one point that um, I think um, Felicity made is that the working class in Britain are coming back onto the arena. One country where they were never very far from the arena is France. And there is an absolutely massive movement to the French working class, something that really puts in the shade the strike wave that we've seen in uh, in Britain. And uh, Comrade uh, EBA from, from France is going to speak next week about, uh, about that struggle. One other thing I'd like to bring to the notice of the comrades is that after a long delay, at last, our journal, our occasional journal, on the brink is coming out. A new edition is coming out in the next couple of days and you'll be notified. It'll be produced both online and in print, print format. And um, I hope comrades will read it and uh, share it with, uh, with their friends and comrades. So thank you for your attendance and see you next week. Just also like to say, just a reminder that we do also have a YouTube channel and the soul of the, all our meetings are posted up on YouTube shortly after the meeting. I have, I have, I'm actually running the YouTube channel. I have added a lot of them. Um, uh, sorry, we could have it. We could have it if you like. I, just, I don't have to stop it. Please, it's our YouTube channel and subscribe to it. We've only got 41 subscribers and there should be more. But there's win meetings going back to 2020 on there. So please do have a look and ask a few things if nothing else, right? Sorry. Sorry, I don't know what's happening. Okay, I've stopped. Good. <laughs> Our lives shall not be sweated from birth until life closes. Hearts starve as well as bodies. Give us bread, but give us roses. As we go marching, marching, unnumbered women dead. Go crying through our singing, their ancient call for bread. Small art and love and beauty, their drudging spirits new. Yes, it is bread we fight for, but we fight for roses too. As we go marching, marching, we bring the greater days. The rising of the women means the rising of the race. No more the drudge and idler in the toil where one reposes. But a sharing of life's glories, bread and roses, bread and roses. That superb song. Thank you for sharing that. All right, so with that, I'll uh, declare the meeting closed. Hope to see you all next week. Good afternoon. Thanks, everyone. Bye.